You're listening to this special release episode of The Dental Guys, COVID-19 update with a CFP. Today on The Dental Guys, we discuss with Justin Goodbread, a certified financial planner, five things that dentist owners need to do right now amidst this shutdown. We also ask what questions should we be asking advisors and what general advice would you give about what to do with our investments? The stock market is down, but is there an opportunity on the horizon? Can we next level this crisis? Find out today on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And we are here uh, once again, kind of continuing our coverage of this crazy time. Uh, And uh, what we've been trying to do, as you guys know, is we've been trying to bring people on the show that are relevant to your dental world right now. And there's a lot of different things. You know, that could be patient management, practice management, uh, how to stay relevant. But today, uh, we've got Justin from Heritage Investors with us and FinanciallySimple.com. And uh, Justin is has been on the show before. You've heard a little bit from him. In fact, you've been kind of hearing from him for a while now uh, with tips and tricks. But uh, today, uh, we've got Justin on to really talk about what you should be doing right now. So Justin, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I'm I'm kind of excited. I get to talk for more than like 15 seconds to a minute here. You know, <laughs> we get to actually speak some um, in some depth here. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, yeah, that's something we're excited about too because we've been, you know, we've known each other a long time, and uh, we know kind of how your mind works a little bit, and uh, we know that you've been. I mean, just first of all, I mean, what kind of hours are you pulling right now? <laughs> um, I'm not sure right now, John. Well, hold on. Um, and Justin, for those of you who don't know what you do, before I maybe ask you that question, tell people what you do on a daily basis. So I'm going to say that we're a wealth management firm. And whenever I say that, people think we manage stocks and bonds. We're different. We're, we're, we, we own a, I own a company that's called a registered investment advisor. Most of our clients are business owners. I would say probably 90% of our clients are business owners. 
with the credentialing that our team has, in fact, I got to tell you, I'm the only person on my team that does not have a master's degree, an MBA. It's kind of funny. Um, but I have a couple other credentials that are, I think, just as valuable. But most of our team realize that for, for our business owners, their largest single asset is their business. And so we make a hyper focus on showing our clients how they can, not everybody does this, but how they can double their net worth every three to five years. That's our mission. That's our goal. We do this one, one meeting, one, one conversation at a time, and we focus on driving net worth. And we use the business oftentimes. So we, even though we, we consider ourselves a wealth management firm, that's what, our, that's what we're, we're coded under. And we do manage a lot of money for people. We do manage a lot of assets, assets being real estate and investing. And I'm sorry, real estate and business. So right now, man, to answer your first question, um, I started my morning this morning about 5 a.m. with the first phone call. Last night, I finished my phone call at about 10 o'clock. I'm pulling some long hours right now. What we're trying to do, and that's not me, that's the entire team. Our entire team is cranking it out. Um, the business advisory side, which are a group of MBAs that have – unbelievable experience. They've been on the phone nonstop answering questions, getting questions, trying to feed me with questions so I can reach out to the community. Um, have a lot of podcasts going on, just like you guys. We're trying to add a lot of value out there in detail. Like last night, I had one of the directors for the Small Business Association on the podcast for like an hour-long in-depth coverage on some of the loans that are now available to us business owners that we're going to talk through a little bit today. So, Buddy, I, I'm honored that I had the opportunity to do this. I really am. This is really where I love to do is that serve our local business. Well, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, full disclosure, right, Justin is a longtime sponsor of the Dental Guys podcast, and we really appreciate Justin coming on today and really trying to break some things down and give you guys some simple tips and um, some things that really um, we're interested in as small business owners. Um, and then secondarily, uh, we're in kind of a special uh, class of uh, healthcare providers that essentially we've been told in the state of Tennessee that uh, we're not to resume uh, work at least until this point, uh, or at least until April 13th. So we're going to shut our offices and our primary income, or really our only revenue uh, income to our business is our patients for one full month. And uh, the governor, Bill Lee, of the state of Tennessee, yesterday issued an executive order uh, stating that we need to uh, step up and, and stop the spread of COVID-19 and these non-essential health care providers. Now, that's kind of a unique thing to dentists. Um, Justin, uh, um, that's one of the reasons why you're on the show is because our revenue just got shut off. And so now... Uh, I'll turn it over to John. Uh, John, we had we kind of formed some questions yesterday for Justin, and so let's start out the podcast. Yeah, um, we want to, as like you talk about, provide value for our listeners, and some of the questions that uh, go come to our mind, and I know that our listeners are are asking, um, is what do I do now, and and what what are some of the first steps? So I asked Justin to kind of put together a top five things that dentist owners should do now. And I, I say dentist owners, it could also be non-owners, a lot of these things. Uh, but I think especially for those in the small business ownership arena, um, Justin, let's go through those kind of one by one and unpack some of the things that you are telling people as you're getting these, these calls with people saying, what do I do? Sure. So the first thing we're going to deal with is we're not going to panic. We're not going to panic. Hmm. It doesn't do anybody any good from yourself, your family, your team, to go into a hysteria running around like chicken little, like the sky is falling. And I'm not seeing a lot of that. I am seeing some of it. Um, I think those of us maybe who are over the age of 40, who's dealt with a little bit more of life um, realize that this too shall pass. Um, those many people, many of our practitioners whom we have the honor to serve have dealt with some tough times in the past. 07, 08 and 09 kind of rocked our worlds. And so those of us who lived through that as business owners, you know, that was a 36 month time period that was interesting and it caused a lot of havoc. It also caused a lot of opportunity. And so um, in my world, man, my world was flipped upside down in 07, 08 and 09. It just was, I mean, I'm in the financial world and it just, it, it was unbelievable. 
So the first thing I'm going to say is we're not going to panic. It doesn't do us any good. You know, I personally believe God's still on the throne. I think he's going to get us through this. I, that's where my hope is. My hope's not in Washington or anything. And I know this isn't a spiritual podcast. That's who I am. You guys know that. Um, so I believe that all things work together for good. I really do. I believe that anytime we're, 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 we're positioned with a challenge like we are right now, that there's unbelievable opportunities to those who keep a sane mind and to those who are viewing and looking for those opportunities. I, I made a quote yesterday quoting the philosopher Olaf from <laughs> Frozen too, right? So I was my kid, I don't ever watch TV and my kids are watching this thing Frozen and Olaf, the little snowman, makes a statement on part two of that show and they're running through this forest and it's all foggy and they can't, they're figuring out, can't figure out where to go and Olaf makes this profound statement. So much so when I heard it, I said, y'all stop it, rewind it. And it just was amazing. It was like, you know, just, just, just profound to me. He said, when you don't know which way to go, the only thing to do is the next right thing. Hmm. And so right now, the fun thing I want to focus on for us, for us business owners, um, for, for you who've never dealt with this situation before is don't panic. Don't panic. Hmm. Life's too short. At the end of the day, we have our families. We have our faith. We have food. We have shelter. And we have what we need in life. And this too shall pass. You say, well, Justin, how can you be so positive? How can you be so um, inspiring at this point, knowing that we're not going to get paid? You know, most of us, most of us in business have been preparing for this. And I'm, I also know that few people have not prepared for this. I heard uh, we, we had one of our colleagues on the, on the podcast, Financially Simple Podcast, and he made this statement. He said, every one of us are going to face something in this. We're going to, some of us are going to get beat up pretty bad. Some of us are. It's the reality of the situation. Some of us are going to come out of this thing crawling. Some of us are going to come out of this thing limping. None of us are going to come out of this thing unscathed. It's just not going to happen. But we are all going to come out of this. We are. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I'm going to say and the five things that dentists should need to know right now is don't panic. What are some of the things that would define panic? You know, what are some of the things that people are calling you and you're saying, whoa, whoa, that's, that's a, that's too fast or that's a panic decision. Don't do that. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, John. So I've, I've had conversations where, you know, we had a really good podcast on Financially Simple with Chris Mahan. I know he's a, he's a regular on your show and an advisor to you guys that's had over 300,000 downloads. It's pretty amazing to see how many people have tuned into that. And they took a little piece of information. People are taking little pieces of, of, oftentimes incorrect information and running a thousand miles an hour at something. So for example, I had, uh, I had an individual who was not a client of mine reach out to us after the podcast. And he said, Justin, I've already canceled all my credit cards. I've already and just started going. I've already canceled my credit cards. I've already paid off all my debts. I've got all the cash out of the bank. I'm now, it's like apocalyptic type fear. And I'm like, mm. time out, dude, your, your movements that you just made could actually end up harming you greater than just being calm at this point. Um, I've had people that instantly went into layoff mode, which may or may not have some problems now with some of the legislation that's coming out that I know we're going to talk through. So yeah. I, I think right now the, the way that we don't panic is we take where we first educate ourselves, which is what you guys are providing a service to. And then we, we take every day and we make the best decision with the full of information that we have on that day. You know, a long time ago, I learned this in, in negotiating, you get as much information as you can all the information you can. And Dennis, you guys are so good at researching. You like research out to the hill. Sometimes it drives me crazy how much you want to research, but you know how to research, get as much information as you can, but then you often miss one thing. You're supposed to delay any decision to the last possible moment. Mm -hmm. So good. whenever you're dealing with crisis, which is where we're at right now, Educate yourself. Listen to John and Wes and the people that he, they're bringing on the shows and others within the community that I've also heard. Listen to that information. Gather it. Internalize it. Ask questions about it. Questioning is not panicking. But then delay decisions until the very last moment possible. And that is how you get through a crisis without panicking. Okay. So what next? After we calm ourselves down and take a deep breath, don't panic, what, what's, what comes next? Uh, you ever heard the statement, brother, cash is king? Mm. It could not be truer. Could not be truer than right now. Cash is king. So let's, let, me, let me explain what I mean by that particular statement. We have been positioning our clients through, that we, we have the honor to serve um, to have lines of credits, to hold large amounts of cash. We call it dry powder. Uh, hold cash back more so than an emergency fund. You guys have heard me through my tips on the financially, I'm sorry, on the you know guys podcast that we want our clients to have three months worth of at home emergency funds to so three months worth of expenses at home 
and three months worth of expenses at work, which oftentimes could be $200,000 in some practitioners lives. And we've been challenged oftentimes that that's just too much cash. It's not working for me. It is. And now you're seeing it work. So right now, if you don't have enough cash, then your job is, is to preserve what you have. So whenever I say cash is king, here's what I, here's what we're telling our clients to do. Again, this is not a car blanche recommendation, friends. I have to say that this is educational purposes. I hope you have your own team. If you don't feel free to reach out to us, we can help you. We know that, but here's the, here's the information we're telling our, our, our clients at this particular point, we want you to not pay off your credit cards. We want you to put as many expenses on your credit cards as possible and pay interest only on those things. I realize that credit cards interest rates are at 15, 20, 30% some places. I realize that, but we want you to maintain high balances on your credit cards. We want you to use your lines of credit at your, with your business and with your home. So if you have a, a home equity line of credit or a line of credit with your business, we want you to use that to live on for the next little bit. We do not want you spending cash. You're like, well, Justin, that makes no sense. Why would you not want me spending cash? Don't you realize my interest rate is X? I understand the interest rates. Wes, you made the statement, man. You said we're now closed down for a month. What happens if this is two months? Mm. What happens if this is three? Heaven forbid. But what happens if it's for three months? The one thing that we have to focus on in crisis mode is being able to take care of those that rely on us to take care of them. Um, your employees will be taken care of because that you, you paid into the unemployment situation and they, they are responsible for themselves at some point. And I understand we'll come to the employees in a little bit, but I want you to think about when you get on an airplane, next time we get on the airplane, in fact, I'm supposed to fly this Friday. I'm a little interested, concerned about that. <laughs> but anyways, um, uh, whenever we get on the airplane, the stewardess is going to tell us, or the flight attendant is going to tell us that put our mask on ourselves before we help our children. At this point, the same thing with cash guys, you want to have enough cash that, if this thing drags on that you can pay your house payment, if it's not able to be deferred, you can provide food for your family, provide water for your family, just the basic life situation. So I'm going to tell you right now, I want you to hold as much cash as possible. That's the yeah. goal with number two. Now that one, that one makes sense, right? I, I, I think everybody kind of gets that. And like you say, now, if you don't have a line of credit, Justin, I mean, can you get one at this point? Is that still doable? I know there's been all kinds of talk about that. Is that something that people should be going out and getting if they don't have it? Um, I'm going to tell you to go apply for a line of credit before you apply for a credit card. If you apply for a line of credit, it's not going to hurt us with some of the SBA lending that we're going to talk about in a little bit. A credit card could perhaps cause us some problems, according to one of the directors of the SBA interview last night. So hmm. if you don't have a line of credit, you can if your financials are up to date and your business was is reasonable and you've got a great relationship, you can get a line of credit. I just had somebody yesterday secure one. So yeah. they are available. Um, are they available to everybody? I think it's a case by case situation, John. One of the things that I do know is available to everybody right now is credit cards. However, um, I've got to caution you not to run out and open a lot of credit cards right now with what we're going to talk about on some of the SBA lending here in just a few minutes. Okay. Okay. So we're not panicking. Cash is king. What's next? Because this is good. This I feel like this is a very systematic way of looking at things. So systematically, whenever I'm looking at a client's life, I always start with cash flow, which is what we're talking about. How are we going to pay ourselves? We're using cash at this point. The next thing I look at systematically in my mind, and you guys are going to recognize this as now we're walking through this, just the way how I operate, is we're now going to figure out how we're going to cut our expenses. Unfortunately, for the, for the majority of dentists out there, the expenses end up being debt. Um, what's, 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 what we're feeling in our persons right now is as late as February 19th, we were cruising at an altitude at supersonic rates. If we're using an airplane analogy, I mean, we were cruising, we had more patients than we can handle. We didn't have to market. Um, we were hiring people. We were buying equipment. We were trying to figure out how we were going to make ourselves more efficient. And then all of a sudden the plane got shut out of the air and here we are on the ground now, right? Less than three weeks later. So what we're feeling now is the, the contraction, that major contraction. And it's not just dense, by the way, it's, it's globally. Marco Rubio made the statement last night that there were three, 30 million business owners in the United States. We're dealing with a particular subsect that has gotten hit and hammered almost as bad as my world, guys. Almost. Not quite. Almost as bad as my world as at this point. So the financial world, we got crucified long before you guys dealt with it. And we're ahead of you by about a month. But you're next. The dental and the entrepreneur doctor that deal with that close contact because of this particular situation is next. So what do we look at third is the debt position. 
Debt is your number one adversary. So I often teach to our clients that you have three things which rob your wealth. Taxes. It is the, if we learn the tax code is the greatest wealth creation tool, that's not an issue today with what we're dealing with. Um, interest is what's, what we're dealing with right now. The pure amount of cash flow that we're having to pay to our debts is what is concerning to us. So how do we deal with it? Well, we talked about this before, but if you haven't done so already, reach out to your banker. They are not your enemy at this point. Mm. Your banker is there as an advocate to help you and say, hey, look, doc, or I'm sorry, hey, look, banker, I need some help. We have no patience. We're mandatory close down like we talked about here in Tennessee. We have no patience. Can you put my my practice note, can you put my building note, can you put my home mortgage into forbearance? And what I have heard consistently from our clients is yes. We're moving things into no payments for three months. We're moving, mm. some people are getting 0% interest. I'm sorry, 0% interest. Some people are, they're, they're paying interest only. Some people have six month time frames. So if you haven't already reached out to your bank or do so now, Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is, is look at your debt in terms of student loans. I know there's a lot of younger practitioners who still have student loan debt. The government is forbearing those. They're, they're moving those, pushing them back. Reach out to your student loan companies at this point and say, hey, look, we need to put our loans in forbearance. There's even positions right now where auto loans, depending on your institution, you can actually forbear your auto loans at this point. I'm seeing that happen. So you say, hey, I just bought a brand new Lexus Land Rover, whatever, or Land Rover with two different things, Land Rover, whatever. And I've got this $1,200 a month payment. You may be able to push that back into forbearance. It, it's all on a case by case basis. So right now, I want you to look at your debt in a position to talking to your lenders, but not only in the sense of how do I not make the payment, but I also want you to start thinking about some opportunities that are going to come about. We don't want to get behind our payments because that's going to hurt us on some of our lending opportunities. But I would like for you to go ahead and pull all your loan documents out. I would like for you to go ahead and pull your financial statements, make sure they're up to date. And let's start preparing for additional debt. Not additional debt in the terms that we're going to go out and take out more debt, but we're going to refinance things. We're starting to see some information come about from the SBA. We're, I know, we're, again, we're going to talk to that in just a few minutes. But we're starting to see some information from the SBA that we perhaps are going to experience some of the loosest lending we've ever seen in our history of our country. Hmm. And I'm of the position that debt is not bad. I don't, I don't believe debt is an enemy. I don't believe it's evil. I think it's a tool just like cash is, just like our real estate, just like our businesses are. And we want to make sure that we're positioning ourselves now to capture and grab hold of that tool here as soon as next week to mm -hmm. utilize that for our business. So the third thing, John, is take a hard look at your debt, forbear it, and then start positioning for a refinance or, protect, or perhaps even additional debt. <clears throat> and I think both Wes and I can speak to that, right? I mean, we've, we've actually done it. We've talked to the bank. And as you said, I mean, it's, it's no problem. You know, they're, they're ready. They're, ex they're actually kind of expecting the call, you know, and uh, immediately had no problem with restructuring things and you know, equipment loans. It was the same thing. You know, I talked to a uh, equipment loan company or banking company, you know, that was a different bank from my, uh, my primary one. And, you know, the, everybody's expecting this. And, but I did not realize that it was even to the point of, uh, uh, you know, car loans, things like that. That's interesting. You know, everything's getting loosened up and it makes sense because we're, we're, I think we're thinking of ourselves, okay, well, we're in this, you know, small business, you know, dental world, but I mean, the, the average person, I mean, this is where we have to be thankful because the average person who's at home, doesn't necessarily have, you know, as many options as we do. You know, if we have a business, we at least have some equity potentially in that business. And many people don't even have that. So no wonder that all of these things are opening up. And there's even discussion about student loan debt forgiveness going on, like $10,000 worth of loan forgiveness. We can talk about that more later. But, you know, this bill that's coming out, which I know I'm anxious to hear your thoughts on later, I mean, there's, there's some things here that are just kind of little hidden gems that are just starting to become, I mean, this is a major restructuring of the way we think about debt. So I, I'm very interested. And Wes, you had no problem either, right? With your banking situation. I mean, it was no issue. Yeah, I called them up and immediately they um, said that, you know, we need to, I said, you know, we need to 
go into a situation where no payments for as long, you know, as possible. And he said, you know, immediately, you know, here's 60 days. And, Mm -hmm. um, which I was like, man, that's awesome. So sign the papers and you just deferred payments on some of the largest, um, capital outlay that you have in your practice. Um, Mm -hmm. one of the things that's unique to me or compared to John is, um, you know, I have a landlord, uh, John, you have a building, um, with a, um, you know, with that payment and my payment is to a landlord. So Justin, maybe the things you could talk a little bit about there is what are you seeing as far as, uh, landlords and what they're actually doing? Yeah. So we've actually had a couple of clients call their landlords and about half and half as of today, have made some adjustments. So here's what I'm proposing that you do if you do not own your own building. And if you own your own building, obviously you speak to the more, the note holder. If you're, if you're renting a place, Wes, as you're talking about, you reach out to your landlord and say, hey, look, we have no revenue. I cannot pay you. Mm. I'm sorry. And you have to understand from an empathetic standpoint of what they're dealing with. They have a note perhaps that they're trying to forbear at the same time. And so you say, look, I know I owe you a thousand, a twelve thousand dollars this month. I know I owe you twelve thousand dollars, whatever the rental rate is. What I'd like to do is I'd like to not pay it this month, maybe not next month. Whenever we get turned around, I would like to catch up my payments over the next 12 months. So let's make the assumption for mathematical for ease of our minds early in the morning like we are. If you owe, owe $12,000 per month and we, miss, we forbear one month, then for the next year, you're going to add an extra $1,000 to your rent payment. Um, I've had several, several clients whose landlord says, that is great. Would you write that in an email for me? And they're, they're fi- thereby, depending on which state you're in, solidifying some sort of a contract for the landlord. And they've been very amendable to that. Again, friends, we most people, especially business owners and landlords are often business owners, they realize the the angst mm-hmm. that especially dentists are dealing with. And as a community, as a whole, as business owners, I think we're all coming together to say, hey, we're holding hands. We're going to get through this. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this is good. So we've got those first three. What What's next, Justin? You know, one of the things we're asking our clients to do is to use your time wisely. Um, many times your, your hands are in people's mouths and you're relying on your team. And I know you have awesome teams. One of the things that we practice in our, in our, with our clients is strategic planning. Strategic planning is basically for simplicity today. And we talked about this through the tips on the uh, Dental Guys show over the last year about is you're trying to identify those three key positions that makes your practice itself and can make it better. So think about the rock analogy that we've all heard. You're going to start off with big rocks first, put them in a jar. So I'd like for you to identify at this particular <clears throat> point, three things that your practice needs. Now, I realize right now you're in a bit of a crisis, but I want to take your mind back to where it was in February. Whenever you were running around like a chicken with your head cut off, trying to stay in focus, and I don't have time to deal with strategic planning. Now you do. Mm -hmm. So I want you to put your mind back in what it was in February. You can do this and identify those three big things that you want to accomplish. Maybe it is, I wanted to develop a strategic marketing plan Mm. that's holistic, that drives my top 10% patient to us and not identifying the bottom 90% of the patients. Maybe it's that. Maybe it is, I want to create a new system within our practice to where I'm now going to do IV sedation. Whatever it is that you want to accomplish back in February, I want you to identify three of those. And those those are what we call the objectives. The next thing we're going to look at is how can we accomplish those objectives? And so those are called our tactics. So if we want to use marketing, we're going to say, how are we going to do that? Well, you may have to hire a firm. That's a, that's a tactic to accomplish that objective. It may be I need to identify my persona for, your, for the clientele. It may be that you need to do customer segmentation. So as you're going through those, once you know your objective, then you have your tactic. Ultimately, you're trying to identify who in your practice and when in your practice can we accomplish these objectives. So you want want you to boil each one of those three big rocks down to three tactics and then finally each tactic down to three action steps. So it's almost like an old diagram in school that has one line, then three lines, and each one of those lines have three. So at the end of it, you have nine actions, specific actions for each of your objectives. Right now, guys, there's no better time. You have the time. You have the intellect. 
Now it's just a matter of over the next few weeks, months, working with your planning team and making your systems of your practice stronger than ever before. And if you focus on your systems, then your practice will accelerate. One of my credentials that I have is what's called a certified value growth advisor. And the idea behind it is, is I can value a practice. I know the valuation that somebody's going to want to pay for, it, but there's 256 points underneath the valuation, which cause the value to increase. And so right now, if you're working with your team, you can say, hey, look, help me increase the value of my practice. I realize it right now feels like it's decimated, but by making that practice holistic and focusing on value, your practice will actually produce more top line revenue, but more importantly, it'll produce more marginal revenue. It's, it's a word called throughput, a word called throughput. It was written by, I forget the doctor's name, but it's called The Theory of Constraints. It's a great book to read. It's been written about the 1980s. And what you're trying to figure out ultimately as you're working on systems is how you can move a patient from the time they say, yes, I want to work with you to recare as efficient with the least amount of touches as possible. And in doing so, your margin increases. Mm -hmm. So right now, friends, you've got the time. You've got the ability to say, Justin, I don't know how to do that. Then you need to hire somebody who does. You say, who do I hire? Well, there's a lot of business advisors out <clears> there. It's one of our firms. We, we, there's a lot of people who can help you. So right now, my fourth point is, is work on your practice systems. That's mm -hmm. where you need to focus right now. Hmm. And it seems like in a, what, we're, what we're really saying here is, is that be ready to go. I mean, yeah. is that what, kind of what you're leading us toward? Uh, yes and no, John. So we're going to go. We just don't know when. Okay. We know that. I want to take us back to the fundamentals. Mm. I want to dive it back even further. Um, I, I wish I could. <laughs> it's it's kind of like in the dental world. And I, I always try to do this and everybody laughs at when I try to compare what I do with you with what, the world you guys operate in. But imagine if you told somebody, hey, look, for the next month, you don't have to, you don't have to brush your teeth or floss. What would that lead to? Well, <laughs> if you're going to sit at home and not work on your business. In effect, you're not brushing your teeth and you're flossing for 30 days. And so what I want you to focus on is not only brushing your teeth or flossing, but learn how to brush your teeth the way the dentist wants you to flush, brush your teeth and then implement it in your system. But not only implement your systems, be prepared to teach your kids and your wife how to brush your teeth properly, right? So in the, in the business world, what I'm referring to, John, is not startup. That's going to come. We're going to mm. figure out how to do that. And I think that's going to be dictated by legislation. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be dictated by some of the lending. What I'm more interested in is how can we make your practice more efficient? Mm. How can we squeeze more blood out of that turnip, so to speak, right? The only gotcha. way that is possible to do that is to identify the eight core elements. And here's, here's a quick teaching point. We've been covering this on, your, on the tips. You have in any business, it doesn't matter the business, friends. You have planning that you have to do. You have leadership that is required. You have sales and marketing. You have the HR department. We call it people. Operations is where you're often really good at. That's how you. That's how you take care of your team. There's a lot of consultants out there that we all can name the names that know how to focus on operations. But then you've got finance and legal. So there's eight key areas of business, and in each of those eight areas, there ends up being 256 points of reference that drive up those eight key areas. So right now, if you say, "Well, Justin, I don't have a marketing plan," now's the time to start working on a marketing plan. You have nothing else mm. to do. Let's focus on it. If you say, Justin, my, I have a lot of turnover in my practice. Well, that's the people area. Now's the time that that becomes a priority for you. You say, Justin, I don't have my financials finished up from December of last year. You're in trouble if that's the case. So let's work on our financials at this point. So what I'm more focused on, John, is the underlying elements of our practices. What can we do to drive the value? What can we do to make those eight key areas um, stable and efficient? Mm, okay. Man, that's good stuff. It is really so good. We got, yeah. We got a lot of work to do, I think. And, and I agree with you. I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot of what, especially if you're paying people, even if you're not, but, you know, we'll get to that in a little bit. But if you are paying people, you know, uh, during this time, I mean, it's a perfect time to, to put them to work on, on the business rather than in the business. And I think that that's something that we, we don't do enough 
in our world in dentistry because we're so focused, like you said, on the operations. So how? So what's next, well, Justin? Well, after before we before we before oh, we yeah. go on to that, right? I think that there's kind of a sub point here, right? Because let's say, Justin, that a lot of our listeners are maybe an associate, right? And they don't have ownership. Like we're talking about true ownership right now and some things that you would advise them. What would you say to the associate or someone that's graduating dental school, right? Because I'm Mm. sure there's going to be some interesting things happen here in May, June with graduation. Some people have already signed up and, you know, maybe are moving or or traveling to a different location right now. Maybe they just accepted a new job. What would you say to the associate in different phases, whether they're currently working or whether they're going to be graduating and moving into associateship? Um, What would you say to them? So let's take the associate who's currently working and let's bust them up for just illustration purposes. Let's say that the associate that's currently working has a desire or is on track to become an owner in the practice. Let's make that first assumption. If you're if you have a desire to be an owner or you're on a track to be an owner, now's the time for you to become an apprentice. Now's the Mm. time for you to work with that business owner, whoever they may be, and learn the systems and add value, by the way, free of charge. It's now's the time for you to actually invest in your education of that practice and learn as much as you can. The the practice owner, especially those who've been there for five, six, seven years, they have an unbelievable knowledge level that candidly, and I I know all of us experience it when I say this, you're going to say, yeah, that's right. We have so much stuff in our head that if we just pause ourselves, it just pours out and it's like, oh yeah, that's old information. But to someone who's never heard it before, it's revolutionary information. Mm. So if you're on track to become an owner in your practice or want to be an owner in the practice, then now's the time for you to put yourself in an apprentice position, not as a practitioner, but as in a business apprentice. If you say, Justin, that's not me. I don't want to be an owner of my business. Great. Right now, as you can self-educate, I can list a, a great number of books. I, I'm thinking about Andrew Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Take a course on sales, on how to sell yourself, how to use proper language so that you can produce more whenever you come back to work, so you can help more patients. So mm. if, you, if you say, Justin, I don't want to be a business owner, but I do love being a dentist, then now's the time to invest in yourself. Now's the time to take a course. Now's the time to learn something that can make you a better dentist. Not as a technician, friends. You guys are so well-trained on technical skills. What we're often missing because of your personality profiles are those soft people skills. So if you don't want to be an owner, learn how to sell something. Take a sales course. Read a sales book at this point. And practice. Learn how. Learn the art of communication at this particular point. Mm. Learn how to sell the intangible. Mm. Maybe you're that individual who just came out of school, and you're like, "Holy Batman, Justin, this has hit me hard." Mm. You know, right now you cannot practice your clinical skills. You can read up on it. You can study some things, but I'm going to challenge you to do the same thing. One of the things I've learned years ago is that no matter what happens in life, no one can take from us our knowledge. Mm. And knowledge is power. The more that you invest in your mind and create a rounded mind for your particular business, the more powerful you'll be as an operator in that business. And if your business says, I'm not going to be the owner of the business, I'm going to be a really good employee who knows how to do bread and butter dentistry. Great. That is your business. Learn how to communicate that. Learn how to speak it. Learn everything about it so that whenever that patient lays down and you know what's in their best interest and they're a little hesitant, that you're able to show them the power that your service can offer them. So, Wes, I think at this particular point, my challenge would be is get out of the dentistry section for a little bit. Use the next 30 days to learn those things, which often you're not focused on, those soft skills, those business skills, those communicative skills, things of that nature. Man, I think that's good because, John, we've talked about this before, is that uh, most dentists, because of our personality type, are not very good communicators. And uh, one of the things that can help you is to develop excellent communication skills. If you're an associate, um, man, that is 
great advice. Uh, there's mm-hmm. some great books you can start reading on communication right now. Just go on Amazon and just type in communication books. I mean, there's some amazing things out there on communication. I know that John and I have even talked about taking some more communication courses over the next year or two. And uh, just learning how to be a better communicator can actually boost your performance. And can you imagine going back to your practice as a an associate as an associate and your performance goes up just because you're a better communicator. I love the advice, John, Justin. So let's deal with the fifth thing here. Um, many of us are thinking about this now. How are we going to start this machine back up? You know, you're shutting it down for a month. Mm. Guys, it's not just going to come back up and running. That's a good point. You know, mm. let's, let's make the assumption here just because we have a time frame. Wes, I think you said it was April 13th. Is that what you said? That In the, the state governor- of Tennessee, it's April 13th. In some states, it's May. Um, so anywhere between April and May. Okay, so let's yeah, and we've the, even got a couple that are out into June, I think. So yeah, it could be three months. I mean, possibly in some places. Let's use April thirteenth, and and we all know that that things could change rapidly tomorrow. As fast as they put that moratorium on us, they could lift it right off, and all these dates could be, hey, go back to work tomorrow. So, mm. I think one of the things that we want to do is plan for the uh, plan for the worst, hope for the best. Okay. Whenever you get ready to start a business back up, go ahead and think about that shutdown procedure that you had to do and reverse it and write it out now. Because whenever we are given the go, whether it's by a time date or by a government mandate, whenever we are told to go, the last thing you want to do is be is be in a panic mode trying to figure out what is it that I need to do. It may be to where, you know, I, I just can only imagine just talking with the dentist that that you're probably going to be on the phones communicating and scheduling far before you ever see the first patient. How, what script is your team going to use? What are they going to mm. communicate? What is the verbiage that's going to use? What's the psychology that you want your patients to rest assured in? Mm. What are the electronic systems that you have to, to start back up? What are the uh, software systems you have to start back up? What are the ordering procedures? Have you, have you been on, when are you going to get on the phone with your labs and say, hey, buddy, I know I use some money. Let's go. So I I think right now, one of the things we can work on is reversing the startup procedure. You say, Justin, I've never had to do that before. No one's had to do that, Justin. I mean, like this. Not necessarily, Wes. Well, not necessarily. Maybe because I'll I'll challenge it because in your case, you started a business. That's true. And you know what it's like to start a business. And so take your mind for those dentists who started a business and go through the exact same process on what it takes to start a business because you're starting a machine back up. It's like cranking the car up. There's a series of events that have to happen. And if you don't start it up in correct order, you can end up losing revenue. You can <clears> end <throat> up being efficient and, and heaven forbid, this could be the, the thing that I would, that I want you to be aware of is starting bad habits mm. because you're going to be coming in with a flood of patients who are going to need you. And more than likely, June, July, August, September are going to be some of your best performance months at this, as far as production goes. You're going to have a flood of patients that need you, and you, the practitioner, are going to be running 12 hours a day trying to get all these things through so you can make the revenue. And all of a sudden, you're going to have bad habits that creep in that could end up harming you another 12, 13 months down the road. So my challenge to you is reverse the order of a shutdown flip it the other side and then start talking with your business consultants, your business advisors to say, Hey, is this what I need to do in order to start my business up? Hmm. That's good. That's good. I think that's going to be uncharted water. Like you say, for most of us, uh, where we've never had to focus that way before, you know, and knowing, you know, how quickly do we ramp back up? What do we ramp back up first, second, third? Um, John, let me ask you this question, right? Okay. So I started from scratch right? Zero patients. You s- didn't really start from scratch, right? Right, right. Now you're not starting yeah, bought with- a, bought, a, bought a practice. You yeah. bought a practice. So, I mean, like, I think the thing here is preparation, right? If we're not preparing, yeah. right, then you're behind the eight ball already, right? Yeah. You're behind the eight yeah. ball. So, Justin- So, what are the things- yeah. Yeah, what are the thing? One of these things that that you you've laid out, I think that this is going to give all of our listeners a, a good starting point on on what we need to be doing now. So, mm-hmm. man, that's good stuff. All right, so I think the next thing you know, we want to know, we've got through these five kind of key things that owners should do right now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
is what should we be asking our advisors right now? Because it seems like we have to be in communication with our advisors constantly, like just to be able to digest some of these things coming out of um, Washington, our state agencies, things like that. So what, what questions should we be asking people? And not just people, thing, right? Because I think here's the here's the knee jerk reaction. I'll just say this, right? Is the knee jerk reaction is to call like your buddy and say, "What are you doing?" Right? Yes. Because yes. It, and is that the a lot right, of that going around? There's a lot of that going around, and I'm a little concerned about that, right? Because what that person does is not specific to my needs. What John does in his practice is totally different than what I need to be doing. I mean, we've talked about these things off air, and my structure is totally different than John's. And you mm-hmm. told me one time, Justin, you said, stop comparing yourself to other business owners. You are specific. Your needs are specific. Your goals are different. And so, um, sorry, it's not my, it's, it, it's, <laughs> I'm not the expert yeah. here, but. Yeah, yeah, but what should we be asking, Justin? Tell us, like, tell every, for, for, that, that could apply across the board to any, any uh, dental business situation. Yeah, so let me drive a stake home right here with what you guys were just talking about. The reason why, in my opinion, and this is pure opinion, and if if you feel like it's wrong, feel free to make mine yours because mine's probably right. I'm joking. That's a joke for levity this morning. <laughs> um, my opinion is the reason why you're asking your peers what they're doing is because you don't have a coach in your life. Mm. You don't have somebody who is orchestrating your team. Mm. What would it be like if I, if I were playing on a football team and I did not have a head coach who could supervise all the different types of coaches, who could supervise the running back coach, the qu- quarterback coach, the kicking coach, the wide receiver coach, the line coach? What would it be like if I did not have a head coach? And the reason why oftentimes that you're calling your friends is because you do not have that coach who can see the big picture for whatever reason. Many times you say, well, it's not, it's not valuable enough. I dare, I beg to differ. Mm -hmm. Our clients are prepared for the most part. I actually read a study yesterday on the the power of coaching Mm -hmm. and having a coach who can see the bigger picture. So Wes, the reason why that's happening is because so many dentist and I'm throwing a shot when I probably shouldn't, but so many dentists want to be DIYs Yep. because you have the intellect to do it. You're so smart. Yep. You're so smart. And you say, I can do this myself. Candidly friends. No, you can't. Candidly friends. You can't. Why is it that Michael Jordan, one of the, my opinion, one of the greatest baseball, basketball players of all times. Why did he have a coach? He did play. Why baseball. did Michael Phelps have a coach? <laughs> What's that? He did play baseball for a little while there. Just to kind of Yeah, well, you know, he was better at basketball, right? <laughs> he, but he, why is it that Elon <laughs> Musk has a coach? Why is it Bill Gates had a coach? Why do they have coaches? Because you need somebody who can look on your periphery and ask you a question. So the first thing that your question assumes is that you have a coach. If you don't have a coach, hire one now. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're out there and they can look at your life holistically and help you drive. So here's what I would ask. If I had clients who were saying, Justin, what questions should I ask you now? Here's what they are. Number one, are my financials up to date? That is to me is more paramount than anything right now. Here's why. Your financials being your profit and loss statements, your balance sheets need to be up to date as of like the end of February and just a few days into March. They're going to become vital in the next little bit with some of the loans that we're dealing with. Your bank's going to need a financial. Some of these, they'll move it without financials, but you're going to need your financials up to date. You're going to need the, de- the numbers as of pre-coronavirus, uh, and you're going to need the numbers from coronavirus onset to present. <clears throat> we have to show the before and we have to show the after. I still have clients who I've been begging them to fire their CPAs. And we probably will now because of this issue that they just aren't doing. It's not a priority. One of the things that I preach is that you should have your financials in your possession by the 15th of every month for the following month. That gives you a clear indication of where you just finished. So the first thing I'm going to ask you, to, the first question I wish somebody would ask me is, Justin, are my financials up to date? Because they're going to be valuable. Uh, another question I'm going to, that I wish somebody would ask me, the questions that you should be asking your advisors is, should I lay my team off? Mm. Should I lay mm. my team off? And that goes to a heartfelt 
uh, concern. I read something on Twitter that I got to be honest with you guys. It ticked me off. I was reading through. I have my Twitter set up as my news feed. I do a lot of um, a lot of writing for national article, uh, national publications, and I like to read what my colleagues are writing, and I like to see what the what the trends are. And this somehow this troll got on my Twitter feed, and they made this comment. They said, "I'm sick of you business owners only thinking of yourself." Hmm. And I went through this little rant, and I looked at that. I looked at my <laughs> wife. It was late at night when I read that. And I said, "Emily, that's not what I'm experiencing." I'm experiencing an angst, a really heartfelt tear between the business owners of what do they do with their team members. And so one of the questions that I would ask you to ask your advisors before you make a decision is should you lay them off? Now, today's answer will probably be different than tomorrow's answer just based on legislation that we're dealing with and some of the ways that we're reading that. Some of you have already gone out and laid your employees off and we'll have to deal with on how to pull all that back depending on the legislation that may pass today. Um, one of the questions is, is how do you subsidize your team? Um, instead of listening to peers, Wes, you made a good point there. I want to deal with one word. It's called microeconomics. Hmm. What ha- takes place in Knoxville, Tennessee, where Wes Mullins is, is totally different than Rogersville, Tennessee, where John Rogers is. Rogers- or Greenville, Tennessee, where, <laughs> John, where John is. Sorry, I said Rogersville. G- Greenville, Tennessee. Hope you're not in Rogersville. There's really nothing up there, John. Yeah, that'd be awesome if I yeah. was, though. Like, I, mean, I could there, own the place. There's nothing there in Rogersville. I've hunted there before. <laughs> um, but no, it's two different economics. And so instead of listening to your colleagues who may be in a different state or even in the same state with totally different demographics, Knoxville is different than Nashville, Knoxville is different than Chattanooga, Atlanta is different than Charlotte, Uh, North Minnesota is far different than South Texas. We've got clients all around the country. And instead of listening to your friends, talk to your team, talk to your advisors about this. Should you subsidize people? Should you lay people off? Should you create hire backs? And then finally, I'd, I'd like for you to have a conversation now with your insurance agent. Go ahead and have a conversation. You know, about a week and a half ago, it was too premature. People were already calling their insurance agent so much so I brought in a, a colleague onto the team, to, onto the air to talk about on our systems. Now's when I want you to talk to your insurance agent. Go ahead and communicate. Hey, look, I may have business interruption insurance. Do I qualify at this point? Now, mm. they're probably going to tell you no, and that's okay. We're, we should get a little bit more guidance from the legislation that the House and the Senate perhaps could vote on today. We should get a little bit more guidance there. We may not need insurance <coughs> because of what the government is, is, is proposing, but I would like for you to go ahead and have a conversation with your insurance agent. If you just will freeze there, freeze there and just, are my financials up to date? How do I handle my team? And let's talk to your insurance and don't, don't go past that for today. Mm-hmm. Then I think those are the questions I wish that our clients would ask their advisors. Wow. That's good. That's comprehensive and and concise. And I think that that, um, gosh, you know, I don't know how much you want to get into that legislation, Justin. There's so much riding on that, right? I mean, it, I, and I'm I'm no expert at it. I've been trying to just read, and you know, I've heard some things from you and from other folks that there's everything in there from you know, like I say, student loan forgiveness potentially to you know, money going out to people to the potential for loans that could be offered to small businesses that could be forgiven completely, uh, potentially. I mean, these are things that could be a complete game changer uh, where we could even, we could go from having to lay everybody off and unemployment all the way to potentially being able to pay everybody maybe a full-time wage and have that be a loan that gets forgiven within a couple of months. I mean, this is I think, everything hangs in the balance over what happens yeah. with this, this legislation. I think we need to tear apart the legislation, though, for clarity. So yesterday on the Financially Simple podcast, and I challenge you guys to listen to it, I did an hour-long interview with my dear friend, Alan Brown. He's an MBA CEPA out of South Carolina. He's the director of the Small Business Development Center in South Carolina. Um, we're trying to get the Tennessee director on. She said, Justin, we will. Let me get a little bit more guidance. And I'll come on your show. So hopefully we'll get the Tennessee director. All the rules apply pretty much nationally. There's little caveats per state. But you have to understand there's three different phases to what we're dealing with. And a lot of people are confusing the three different phases. And so let me see if I can speak a little bit to the, to the three phases of, our, of what we're dealing with. First, when it, well, before we get to the three disaster <clears throat> phases, we have the traditional SBA loan. And SBA, candidly, is a pain to deal with. Um, Very few people don't want to deal with the Small Business Association because they like make you donate your kidney, your left toe, and maybe your child as part of the underwriting of that particular lending. So we're not talking about traditional 7A lending or things of that nature. We're talking about the disaster 
the disaster lending that's in place at this particular point. And they've rolled out three different crisis phases. Phase one was the disaster loan program. It had $8.3 billion in it. One billion of it was for the economic injury disaster loan. We call that, that's House Resolution 6074. That particular loan dealt with more of the infrastructure for the SBA. It was kind of getting the SBA ready to deal with um, to deal with this major issue that's coming. And so there was some relief there for some um, for unemployment, things of that nature in the initial phase, but mostly it was helping fund the SBA to get ready to, to deal with this. Phase two was what was signed last Wednesday by president. That was House Resolution 6201, and we call that the Family First Bill. I actually interviewed Michael Gamboli, who was one of the, um, who's an attorney with, uh, I can't go too deep in there, but he has a lot of information <laughs> um, about the Family First Bill. We talked about should it even apply to dentists? A lot of people don't think it does. In fact, I've yet to find out of some 25 attorneys who deal with HR law, I've yet to find one who says businesses under 50 employees are, are having to deal with that. Um, so I, I know the ADA was trying to lobby against it. I think they were doing that for some of the large organizations, some of the DSOs and things. I don't see at this point that that family first bill is directly applicable to many small business owners. Now, again, I'm not an attorney. That's not, that's a disclaimer there. This is just what I'm <laughs> being told. I'm kind of repeating back, but Phase three is like the grand poobah. I mean, this is like the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Um, I actually spent Sunday reading this bill that was that failed in the Senate because I wanted to see the, the details of it, and it is, it is steep. It's a $2 trillion spend that our government is trying to push out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Marco Rubio said, hey, look, guys, you've got 30 million business owners. On this particular bill, there's a lot of things that are interesting. So here's some interesting caveats. The first one is, is that used to be you had to have employees in order to receive certain benefits. Not anymore. If you're a business owner, the 30 million businesses are those that have employees and those that do not. So where this could be applicable to dentists, if you're a Schedule C subcontractor and you have no employees, let's say you're a floating doc who floats from practice to practice, this now affects you. This is not mm. just for the doc who has employees. This could also be sub, uh, Schedule C independent contractors who are practicing dentistry. So that's amazing. Mm. Number two, we have dentists who have buildings and, res and real estate that are in trader business companies, like an LLC or an S corporation. You're, you now qualify for some particular lending that before residential investors, I'm sorry, real, real estate investors didn't qualify for <laughs> underneath this lending. You're right, John. They're in the in the way that the bill was drafted, at least from the the House portion of it that I read yesterday, there is some student loan forgiveness. Now that's a sticking point. That's some people are arguing that's a political play. And you're right, the number is ten thousand dollars, which has been negotiated. We we I haven't seen the current version. I don't know if that's going to stay or not. It could. Um, I'm also seeing inside the bill. And I'm talking with uh, the director of the SBA program that some of these SBA loans could be as long as 30 years in duration at interest rates in the two to three percent range. Hmm. So we're not talking about the traditional five year note that is at six, seven percent. We're talking about long term loans <clears throat> that we're going to perhaps be able to restructure our building debts. We're going to have to be able to restructure our practice notes. We're going to be hopefully able to free up cash flow which from an economic standpoint will provide an injection into our economy that'll help us pull out of this. Um, the biggest note, part of this note, which is interesting to me, is the loan forgiveness portion of it. Yeah. And there's some interesting things inside there. Now, I've read two different versions of this. Again, I don't know what's going to pass. I've read a version, the Senate bill, that said that you could basically get up 150 to 250% of your, of your payroll, which includes your doctor pay as well, in a forgiveness note. So if you, if, let's say, for example, that your, that your monthly pay is $50,000 for the entire practice, including yourself, then you may be able to get 125000 And then if you maintain employees for 90 days, and it's completely forgiven. Talk about a stimulus. It's there. And candidly, that is not one of the points that the that the parties were arguing over. So hmm. I, I don't see that one I moving mean, away. Just, man. You just pause for yeah, a second. I now. knew you were getting ready to, John. <laughs> it's hilarious. I mean, because when I heard this from it, and and you know, this is this is right. Like I heard it from a friend. 
right? Because that is how it started for me. You know, a friend of mine who who is involved in a, a, a corporation that I know, um, he he told me because they've got lawyers at their corporation that are looking at this stuff, and he said, "Hey, man, have you heard about this?" And I said, "What? Are you, come on, that's crazy. Mm. That's crazy." And then I and then I talked to a couple people, including Justin, and uh, yeah, it looks like this is a possibility that that could be a game changer. And, yeah. and that could be a total, and, and, but that only applies if you keep the employees and there's a lot of things that we still don't know, but gosh, that could be crazy. Well, where it's going to get interesting, John, is in the legislation that was in the, on the house bill on Sunday. Again, I have no life. I read the whole stupid thing. <laughs> then it got voted down. Okay. <laughs> but what the legislation on Sunday said that we had to hire our teams back by April 1st. Mm. I got to tell you, I, I've watched politics for too long in my life. In fact, at one point I considered running for a politician. I was like, Thank you. no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. But I've watched politics for too long. I have to believe that if they vote a bill today, that they're not going to hold that April 1st hire date. I just have to believe. Now, again, I haven't seen the final, final legislation, but there is inside the ruling has said that if you hired your team back, you, they were eligible for that loan that would be forgiven. And that is a huge stimulus. I mean, man, it, it could be amazing. Now here's where it gets even trickier. Okay. And this is why your financials are imperative right now. I was talking with him with, with um, the SBA director, and he said, Justin, in many different areas, and we were talking specifically about the financial world and about the entrepreneurial doctor world, he said, Justin, it may take you six months to get back to normal. It's not going to happen like the minute we say, okay, give us a loan, let's go back to work. It may take us six months. Now, I imagine dentistry will come back on a little faster than the economy, which is the way I get paid. But he said, he was saying, Justin, what you want to look at is, is you want to cast out what's called normalization of your, of your profit and loss statements. You want to cast out what you think the economic damage was to you and apply for about 20% more than that. Hmm. You want to apply for more than what you think to get you back to whole. So he said, Justin, in your case, with the financial world, I want you to look out to October 31st mm. and take what you think the economic damage has been since February 19th to October 31st, calculate it, be able to articulate it, and then be able to show it to the disaster fund for the SBA. And he goes, more than likely, you're going to get a larger portion than just, hey, I just want to, I just want to protect my current employees. So my challenge to us at this point is we don't know 100% what the details are. I know what they're arguing about. And I can't candidly from, you know, from a political standpoint, I love to see our democracy at work right now. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of darts are being shattered <laughs> amongst the Republicans and Democrats. I get it, but this is true democracy. And I genuinely believe with what I've read and what I've heard that they're doing their best to help the small business owners and ultimately help the employees in our economy. So wow. at this point, I got to go back to make sure your financials up to date they're going to be imperative here as soon as maybe next week. Well, and I think too, I mean, if there's one thing I'm hearing from this, I think Wes and I both make sure you have a team here because this stuff is not something, I don't care how smart you are, that you can navigate on your own. You know, if this does become reality that we're talking about all of these programs and plans and, you know, it's almost like a, it's almost like if all of a sudden the Congress passed a flat tax right? Like what would happen in like the CPA world? It would be like, they're learning just as much as anybody. They're going to have to figure this out and they're going to have to interpret this for us. So you better have a good accounting team. You better have a good financial planning team and you better be talking to these people now rather than later. Now in the short time we had, cause I wanted, I know we took a lot of time on that, which was well worth it. But the other thing people are asking, all of us are asking is what do I do with my investments now. So, so I know we don't have a ton of time left, Justin, but can you give us some, some quick, just, just general advice? Uh, because everybody's situation we know is different, but what are some things that you want people to be thinking about with their investments? Because people are definitely, you know, very nervous right now. Yeah, so let, I've got to do the disclaimer first, friends. I have to do this because we are registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And registration does not mean that we received any type of notoriety or endorsement from the government. That's not the case. And we also understand that past performance, just because it happened in the past, is not indicative of future results and any assertion to the contrary is a federal offense. So this is not recommendations for you particular. I'm going to tell you to speak specifically to your team. If you don't mm -hmm. have a team, reach out to our office. We do this day in, day out, and we know how to work through these times. So that's my disclosure off the bat before I jump into your answers to your question, John. So here's, here's what I, from general guidelines, let me set the stage. 
I mentioned <laughs> earlier that the economy back in February was unbelievable. We were, we were accelerating. I mean, the foot was on the gas. We were running at about 3.35, 3.5% annual GDP. This is not 2008, 2009, 2010. Go back to fundamentals of finance, supply demand. And I'm going to overly simplify this. I know if there's anybody who understands finance, you're going to say, Justin, you just, you just butcher that. I'm doing that intentionally. My, my podcast is financially simple because I want to take these complex things and make them simple. So here's the bottom line is we have supply demand. Whenever demand, whenever you have more demand for the service, you have an economy that's going to grow. Whenever you have too much supply, so there's more supply than demand, you have an economy that's going to contract. Back in 07, 08, 09, we had more supply than we had demand. And so we could actually see, I can remember vivid conversations. I have them documented with clients where we were saying, hey, look, the storm clouds are out there. We can see the supply demand chain right now. Something's got to give. This is not going to go on forever. That is not the conversations we were having in February. Now, we may were saying, and I had some of these conversations, I said, you know, we're a little pri- we're priced a little high. Our PE ratio, price burning ratios are higher than what they need to be. We need to make some adjustments. We had business owners. We were looking at their business and we were saying, man, you're having a stellar point. Don't go out and buy more, more, more capacity. Don't go out and buy more equipment right now. I think this is a short term move. So we were looking at businesses, the dental practices, and we were looking at the overall economy saying, we're in good shape, but let's be cautious. Then all of a sudden, coronavirus hit. What we're dealing with right now is not 2007, 8, 9. It is not. Now, does it mean it's going to take, it's going to come back and spring like a rubber band right back into being? Who knows? In fact, if you guys have a crystal ball, if you have an extra one, I'd love to have it. I could really use it right now to tell you what the future holds. I don't know what it holds, but I can tell you this, that the stock market is on sale. The bond market, several positions, is on sale. Whenever we deal with money, we're dealing with balanced portfolios. We, we don't believe in individual stock investing. We just don't believe that. We believe that highly diversified, low-cost investing is what drives us. And ultimately, at the end of the day, for you practitioners, your business is your number one asset. And that's the asset that we want to grow. And candidly, that's the asset that our firm focuses on to help you double your net worth. That's our goal is to double your net worth every three to five years. Is it always possible? No, but that's our goal is to help you do that. So here's the advice we're giving several of our clients right now. Roth IRAs, if you want to put money into a Roth IRA, now's the time. You now have until July 15th, I think it is, based on some of the rulings. We had the extension. Uh, that's July 15th, I think. It's, yeah. Um, we have some time to put money into the Roth IRAs at this point. You say, well, Justin, I don't have any cash. Maybe consider a conversion. You know, we, are, we, we assume that our income is going to be lower this year than it was last year. And so if that's the case, we want to do a conversion on our IRAs, perhaps, and go to Roth IRAs right now. Not a bad time to do that. It's also not a bad time to to set a new basis in your non-qualified assets. We had clients that, man, we put in X number of dollars back four or five years ago, and then it grew, 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 grew. And then all of a sudden, now it's right back down to where it was four or five years ago. Reset the basis. I can sell through tax loss harvesting and get a higher basis in that account going forward. I'm also can great gain some short-term losses and some short-term, I'm sorry, and some long-term losses right now. And I can use those short-term and long-term losses to do tax loss harvesting later this year in portfolios. Not a bad move right now. You may want to consider dumping in your maximum contribution to your 401k. We've had several clients who said, hey, Justin, I think we're near the bottom. And again, I don't know the timing. This thing could go down to the 20%. I don't know. But we could be tomorrow could be the turnaround day. We just don't know. So you may want to go ahead if you're cash flush and max out your contributions to your qualified plans. Um, Another one that we're having to deal with right now is we use a lot of what's called cash balance plans. It allows our our doctors to, to defer hundreds of thousands of dollars, which allows us to help them grow their net worth. And right now we're having to recast and re recalculate the uh, cash balance plans. There's a rule that says a thousand hours in place. And so we're working with, with TPAs, third party administrators to help us figure out, do we adjust those cash balance plans back? You may have a piece of property, a piece of real estate right now that you said, man, I wish I could have sell, sold this rental house. I wish I could have sold this piece of property, right? But because of the basis, man, if I'd have sold it, I've got ham with taxes. Now's not a bad time if you want to jump out of that position, that property, to go ahead and sell out. And there are people buying. They're out there. You may want to sell out the property and then redeploy those monies. You say, well, Justin, how do I know? 
I ask the question when it comes to real estate investing, if you had X number of dollars, let's say it's a piece of property for $300,000. If you had $300,000 in cash today, would you buy that exact same property today and hold it as a long-term investment? If the answer is mm. no, then you need to be speaking <clears throat> with your planning team to see if now's the time to sell and reposition your portfolio. Speaking mm. of repositioning your portfolio, now's the time to do tar target band rebalancing and moving the portfolio into a recovery mode. I'm not a fan of selling when things are down. I'm not. I lived through 07, 08, 09. I saw people when they started panicking, they went to cash. All you do many times is lock in your losses. Sure, you may make a good decision and save a little bit of downside, but when are you going to get back in? And many times people cannot jump back in at the right time, which is why DY investing is so dangerous. So if I were giving general recommendations around investments in general, I would say those points, John, that I just outlay, but I leave it with a caveat. Those are just educational points. Please, please, please talk to your advisor about your specific situation. This is not investment advice, yep. but it does show the urgency of what you can do right now. And there's a lot of opportunity right now. Well, we have packed a ton Whoa. of value into this hour or so for you guys. And um, you know, this is something to take and digest, probably watch a couple of times and uh, make sure you have a good team in place. And uh, Justin, I want to thank you for being with us. I respect your time. Let you get back to your busy, crazy day. Uh, be careful, be healthy, be safe out there. Um, we thank you for what you do and for advising uh, dentists and many other businesses on how to make it through this and, and, and how, to, how to get through this. Because like you said at the beginning, we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Just have to have a good team in place. So uh, for those of you who've enjoyed this, uh, comment, like, share, subscribe, uh, check out financiallysimple.com and Heritage Investors. That's where you can find Justin and uh, continue to follow us. The Dental Guys will be bringing you more content this week as we go on almost every day of the week. This week, we're going to have something that's going to really add value to you. So have a great rest of your, uh, rest of your day. We'll be in touch soon.